Please note that this podcast contains information regarding sensitive events, including domestic violence, assault and abuse, as well as other triggering events, such as murder. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. When Alice jumped down the rabbit hole, she immediately regretted her decision. A rabbit hole is a metaphor for something that transports someone into a troubling, surreal state or situation. Welcome to Afterglow, the unveiling of the Idaho cult. This podcast will take you down the deepest of rabbit holes as it unfolds. The story is so compelling, so bizarre, and so heinous, it's impossible to look the other way. Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow were dedicated in the most horrible way to an ideology that should only be fiction. Instead, Their ideology put them behind bars. Join us as we explore the lives, lies, and diabolical crimes of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. I'm your host, Kathy Brooks. Please follow and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hello and welcome back. I have to sincerely apologize for the break. I wound up, you know, just having a really busy time over the last few months and have barely been able to do my laundry basically but things have changed now they've settled down and if you have not been following me on youtube please go over to my youtube channel and subscribe it's called left undone incomplete investigations we just wrapped up a six-part series that premiered every saturday for the last six weeks on chad according to chad yes dug deep into chad's writing Chad's audit biography, and wow. So you will not be disappointed. At some point, I will post those audios over here, but they are already up on YouTube if you want a little bit of Chad, since Chad's trial is literally this week. So again, I do apologize, and I will be here as much as possible. I would love for this to be my full-time job, but unfortunately, it does not sustain even my Uh, gas in my car these days. So, you know, it's not sponsored and I have had a difficult time um, and time just to find sponsors. So basically it's crowdfunded. So if you would like to help support my show and help me get it out there, um, supporting it helps pay for the software I use, the music rights that I have to get, the audio equipment, you know, all that stuff and my time. So I do appreciate you. And maybe someday it can be my full-time job. Wouldn't that be nice? I would not, I would not mind. I am a registered nurse and I, uh, you know, at some point would like to just take a breather and do something a little bit more creative and enjoyable like this podcast and important as well. I need to be doing something important. And this is understanding this case is extremely important to me. I've come to know a lot of the victim side uh, people in this case, and it's just truly heartbreaking. Kay and Larry Woodcock are wonderful people, and I support them 100%. I also have to shout out to Difficult Research. Kresha K. Easton is Kay Woodcock's daughter, and she has a fabulous YouTube channel that has um, been very invested in this case. Clearly, I mean, it's her family, but she's done a lot of really good research as well on this case. So if you want to check her out and subscribe on YouTube, I think that would be fabulous. So I wanted to let you know that I got an email this week, and the link is in the show notes below, but it is... I was really impressed that I got this. It says, I would like to personally congratulate you as your podcast, Afterglow Unveiling the Idaho Cult series, has been selected by our panelists as one of the top 10 Idaho true crime podcasts on the web. They are at blog.feedspot.com. Link is below. And I think that that's great. There's a bunch of really good podcasts in the list. So more for you to listen to, go check them out. And I would think, I would like to thank them very much for putting me in their Feedspot Top 10 Idaho True Crime Podcasts. If you haven't left me a five-star review and you think my podcast is worth it as an independent, no production company, one woman show deserves a five-star review, then please leave it. 
And of course, on wherever you're watching your podcasts or listening, wherever you're listening your podcasts. So today, I'm not going to talk. I am just going to play Melanie Gibb at the Chad Daybell preliminary hearing back in August of 2020. Now, let me paint the picture a little bit. Melanie Gibb is being called to the stand to testify. Chad Daybell is sitting there at the defense table with John Pryor, his attorney. This is his preliminary hearing. Rob Wood is cross-examining and questioning. And Kay and Larry Woodcock are sitting in the courtroom with masks on. Remember, this was August of 2020, peak COVID time. Luckily, they were able to actually have a hearing in person, and it's interesting to listen to the questions. I would love to know what you think about John Pryor. He rubs me kind of the wrong way. We'll see how he does. I do think he's probably a pretty good defense lawyer, and I think that hopefully the prosecution in Chad's case, I'm jumping ahead here to 2024, is strong. And uh, because I know John Pryor will present a defense. And when you get here on Afterglow to Lori's case, nobody um, came up to take the stand in Lori's defense. So here we go. Welcome to Afterglow. Here is Chad Daybell's preliminary hearing from August of 2020. Miss Gibb, if you'll please come forward. You can come here through the gate on this side. Ms. Gibb, if you'll stand here in front of this plexiglass, raise your right arm and face the clerk. Do you summon, sir, for the testimony you're about to give this class? Ms. Gibb, I didn't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Gibb, you can uh, be seated here at this witness chair. Ms. Gibb, if you'll scoot up to that microphone and then uh, pull it down below your chin and aim it at your chin. Mr. Wood and Mr. Pryor, I think the record isn't uh, picking up your voices as well as it is everybody else's. So if you'll do the same, pull that down and then point it up at your chin, it makes a much better record. If you'll pull it down, Mr. Pryor, and then point it up kind of like this so that you don't talk over it. Mr. Wood, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, will you state your name and spell it for the record? Melanie Gibb, G-I-B-B. Okay. Um, Ms. Gibb, are you familiar with the defendant, Chad Daybell? Yes. Approximately, when did you meet him? About three, four years ago. Okay. Uh, Do you remember where you met him? Yes, I was in Morgan, Utah. Okay. Um, Since you've met him, uh, what is the nature of your relationship? Um, the nature of our relationship, um, was talking about some of the books that Chad had written and, um, his relationship with Lori. Uh, you mentioned Lori, is that, uh, Lori Vallow? Correct. Okay. Uh, Approximately when did you meet Lori Vallow? October, 2018. Uh, and do you remember, do you call, recall where you met her? Yes, in Mesa, Arizona at a church. Okay. Uh, what was the basis of your relationship with Lori Vallow? Um, it was based upon things that we talked about, which were spiritual in nature. Uh, would you call yourself, uh, were you friends with Lori Vallow? Yes. Are you familiar, or do you know if Lori Vallow had any children? Yes. Are you familiar with Tylee Ryan? Yes. Did you ever meet Tylee Ryan? Yes. Um, and did you ever have opportunity to see Tylee Ryan with Lori Vallow? Yes. Okay. And was Tylee Ryan Lori Vallow's daughter? Yes. Uh, Ms. Gibb, when was the last time you saw Tylee Ryan? July or August of 2019. Uh, where was that? 
in her house in Chandler, Arizona. Okay. Are you familiar with JJ Vallow? Yes. Who is JJ Vallow? Lori's adopted son. Okay. Um, when you spent time with Lori, did you uh, have occasion to uh, spend time with JJ at all? Yes. Okay. Ms. Gibb, I want to call your attention to, well, do you recall where you were uh, between the dates of September 19th, 2019 and September 23rd, 2019? Yes. Where were you? Rexburg, Idaho. Why were you there? I was there to visit Lori. I was also there to be at an event called Firm Foundation. Okay. Uh, when did you, do you recall when you arrived in Rexburg? Thursday the 19th. And do you know approximately when you left Rexburg? Yes, I left Monday the 23rd around 9.30 in the morning. When you were in Rexburg, uh, where did you stay? In Lori Ballow's house. Do you recall the address of that house? No. Uh, do you recall the general location of that house? It was a townhome. I, I don't know the name of the street. Okay. Uh, was that townhome located in Rexburg, Idaho? Yes. Yeah. Uh, during that weekend, um, did you have uh, opportunity to spend to spend time with Lori? Yes. Okay. Uh, about how much time did you spend with Lori that weekend? Um, most of the time, except for on Saturday, I spent most of the day, about 10 hours, um, up the street at that event. Okay. Um, when you were at Lori Vallow's house, did you ever have occasion to see Chad Daybell there? Yes. Okay. Um, do you recall approximately how many times you saw him there that weekend? Two, three, four times, maybe. Okay, so you don't recall an exact number? Not an exact number, but okay. I think every day. I think every day is probably, except for the Monday. Okay, and it was Monday, September 23rd? Yes. Okay. Did you have occasion to witness uh, Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell interact with each other? Yes. Uh, how did they interact with each other? Affectionately. Okay, and when you say affectionately, uh, what do you mean by that? Um, Holding hands, um, hugging, light kissing. Okay. Did you ever have occasion to speak with, uh, when you were during this uh, four, approximately four day period in September, did you ever have occasion to speak with Lori Vallow about the, uh, the nature of her relationship with Chad Daybell? Yes, we, we talked about it often. Okay. Uh, what did she tell you about that relationship? Um, that they were very much in love with each other and wanted to be together as soon as possible. Okay. And did you ever speak with uh, Mr. Daybell about that relationship? Most likely, but I can't recall the exact words. Okay. Uh, Ms. Gibb, during that September 19th to 23rd, 2019 period, did you ever see Tylee Ryan? No. Did you speak with Lori Vallow about the location of Tylee Ryan? She informed me that Tylee was at BYU Idaho and mentioned something about being with friends. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, when you were during that same period, did you have occasion to uh, see JJ Vallow? Yes. Uh, where was he located when you saw him? He was in the family room mostly and then outside some. Okay, when you say the family room, uh, can you be more specific? The room that's adjacent to the kitchen. Okay, and uh, what home was that located in? Lori Bella's home. Okay. Ms. Gibb, I wanna call your attention to the night of September 22nd, 2019. Uh, do you recall what you did that night? Ms. Gibb, um, you're, you're facing the, uh, the state. I'm gonna invite you to turn your chair just a little bit 
so that I this can way? see you. Oh, this way? This way, so that I can see your face as you're speaking. I recognize you're answering Mr. Wood's questions, but I need to see your face as well as you're answering. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, what did you do the night of September 22nd, 2019? The night of 20, uh, the 22nd, I was um, doing a recording with Lori and David Warwick, and we were in the kitchen uh, recording that. Who is David Warwick? He is a boyfriend of mine. Okay. Um, and you said you were recording a podcast? Yes. Was Mr. Daybell there during the recording of that podcast? No. Okay. Uh, do you recall if J.J. Ballard was there during the recording of that podcast? I did not see him. Okay. Um, did you see Alex Cox that night? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, what did you witness or what did you observe Alex Cox doing that night? He brought J.J. into the house um, during the middle of the podcast. Okay. And, and did you see him bring JJ into the house? Yes. Okay. Um, was J, uh, how did Alex Cox bring JJ into the house? He carried him in okay. and he was asleep. And that just may have occurred, but I'm trying to get a foundation as to the time again. I may have missed it, and I apologize if I missed it. Mr. Breyer, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Do you mind pulling your microphone down and then aiming it up at your chin? So, there you go. Repeat that one more time. Judge, I missed the, um, the time, and I, I can't recall what time she said if she did. Uh, when um, that occurred with Alex bringing the baby in, I don't recall. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll label a foundation, Your Honor. I didn't know if you did or not. I, 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 may, I thought I may have missed it. Please do. Um, Ms. Gibb, Ms. Gibb do, you, do you recall about what time Alex Cox brought JJ back into the, to Lori Dallas home? I can say we recorded the podcast between nine and after midnight, a little after midnight. So someone in between that time. Okay. You don't remember the exact hour? I don't. Okay. Um, I'm going to call your attention to the morning of September 23rd, 2019. Uh, what did you do during the morning of September 23rd, 2019? Upon awakening, I got ready for the day and came downstairs, had a brief conversation with Lori Vallow, and then got into the truck with David, and we drove off to Pocatello. Okay. Um, what was your conversation? Do you recall the content of your conversation with Lori Vallow that morning? Yes. Uh, and do you recall approximately what time you had these this conversation with Lori Vallow? Sometime between eight and nine. Okay. Uh, what did you speak about with Ms. Vallow that morning? She shared with David and I that uh, JJ was acting um, with a lot of energy and um, I'm trying to remember the words, but she recalled um, him climbing upon the refrigerator, knocking a picture down of Jesus, she said, and then climbing up upon the cabinets. Okay. And did you see JJ that morning? No. Okay. Uh, do you know if he was in the house that morning? No. Okay. And do you, do you have any uh, any idea of where he was that morning? No. Okay. Over the course of that weekend, uh, did you ever have a conversation with Lori Vallow about Kay Woodcock? Yes. Uh, what was the nature of that? Uh, do you remember when during that weekend you had that conversation? Friday, Saturday, it could have been okay. several of the days. I'm not sure. Uh, what was the what was the nature of that conversation? She was expressing that she wanted um, JJ to go live with Kay, and she can she expressed um, different solutions. Um, he could either stay with Kay or 
I believe, a son of Kay's that had a family already that JJ was comfortable with or that they liked JJ and it was a good match. I think they had a little girl and she said that she would express to Kay that he was, um, that she was sick or something was wrong with her so that she could um, uh, live with him. So, uh, so that who could live with? JJ could live with Kay. Okay. And at any time after that weekend, did you ever have a follow-up conversation in regards to that, uh, to that subject? Yes. Uh, do you remember approximately when you had that follow-up conversation? It was shortly after, I can't recall. Okay. Uh, what was the, the nature of that follow-up conversation? I asked how it went, giving JJ to Kay. She told me that they met up in an airport and she told Kay that she had breast cancer and that she would need help with JJ for a period of time. And she said it went well. Okay. Uh, so was it your understanding after that conversation that JJ Vallow was located with Kay Woodcock? Yes. And had you ever met Kay Woodcock? Briefly. When? Um, the time that Charles Vallow was moving out of his house in Arizona to Louis, um, Texas. And who was Charles Vallow? Uh, Lori's husband. Okay. Ms. Gibb, I'm going to call your attention to the date of November 26, 2019. Uh, do you recall uh, where you were, where you were on November 26, 2019? I do. Where were you? I was in Pleasant Grove, Utah, in David Warwick's home. Okay. Do you live in? Do you live in Utah? No. Where do you normally live? Gilbert, Arizona. Okay. And so, were you visiting Mr. Warwick that day? Yes. Okay. Um, did anything significant happen? Uh, that day in regards to Chad David? Yes. Okay. Uh, what contact, if any, did you have with Mr. Daybell that day? I received a phone call from Chad Daybell from his cell phone to my cell phone, and um, I answered the phone call. Okay. And do you recall approximately what time it was? Late morning. And you, you said you got a call from his cell phone? Mm -hmm. How do you know it was his cell phone? Because it, when the phone number came up, it had his name on it. Okay, and was that a contact you had previously stored in your cell phone? Yes. Okay. And I was... Ms. Gibb, had you previously had any discussions with Mr. Daybell through that same phone number? Yes. Okay. Um, do you recall what that phone number was? Yes, it was 208-690-9374. Okay. Um, and I may have already asked this. I apologize if I did. Approximately what time did you, were you called by Mr. Daybell that day? Late, late morning. Okay. What was the nature of that conversation? He said, hi, Melanie, this is Chad. Um, the Rexburg police are going to call you. Don't pick up. He okay. said, oh. Okay. Uh, where did the conversation go from there? He, um, he let me know that the police were over at Lori Vallow's home in Rexburg, and that um, they were inquiring about where JJ was, and that she was going to tell the police that JJ was with me. Okay, how did you respond? In shock, and I can't recall if I said anything at that moment. Oh, I did say, after the shock, I said, JJ's not at Kay's house. And how did Mr. Daybell respond to that? He said no. Okay. Uh, did you, uh, 
was there any other content to that conversation? I asked him if he was nervous and he said yes. Okay. Was anything else said? I can't recall. Okay. That same day, November 26, 2019, did you have any contact with Lori Vallow? Yes. Okay. Do you remember approximately where you were when you heard from defendant from Lori Vallow? Yes, I was in the same place. Where, and, okay, and where was that again? That was in uh, Utah, in David's home. And approximately what time did you hear from defendant Vallow? Lori Vallow? I possibly within an hour or two, I can't exactly recall. Okay. And when you say an hour or two, what, what is that in reference to? Her calling me. Lori calling me. Right. Was it an hour or two after after what? After, I'm sorry, J Chad's phone call. Okay. Um, what was the nature of that conversation? Uh, when I picked up, she said, hi, Melanie, this is, you know, well, she probably didn't say her name, but she said, just want to let you know everything's fine. She was upbeat, cheery, acting like nothing was wrong. Uh, where did, what happened after that? Um, she told me that the police had been there asking for JJ and that she told the police that I had JJ, that I was at a movie called Frozen, that she asked me just to pick up my phone and take a picture, a random picture of kids running around, um, and that she would come by and pick him up and then, no, I'm sorry, that after me driving home from Utah to Arizona, that she would come and get him later that week. I'm going to stop right there. He's okay. good. Uh, I'm going to point you, you back to this conversation or the statement about uh, picking up your phone. Mm -hmm. What did she ask you to do with that again? Take, take a picture of random kids to make it look like it was JJ. Okay. Um, and and I kind of lost track. I apologize. That's you, okay. you said something about driving down to Arizona. What was what was that part of the conversation? Who said what? So she knew that I was going down to Arizona for Thanksgiving back to my home. And she said that she told the police that she was going to pick him up from my house from Arizona, which I had no previous knowledge to this. This was new information to me. Okay. Um, did Lori say anything else to you about JJ? Um, I can't recall exactly, but I can recall what she talked about, about Kay. Okay. Did, okay. What did she say about Kay? She said that, um, Kay was trying to kidnap JJ. And I said, how do you know? And she, she said, well, I've received emails, you know, being threatened that that was, um, that he was going to kidnap her. I said, well, what, what does she say? And she said, well, she sent me emails and she said, she quoted Kay saying, it's not like I'm going to kidnap him or anything. And that she was, um, that she was trying to protect JJ and from her and other people, not just Kay, but possibly family members as well. Okay. And you said that to your perception, she seemed upbeat and positive. Were yeah. those the words you used? Yes. Okay. Um, to your perception, when you spoke with Mr. Daybell that day, uh, how did he sound? Very nervous. Is that why you asked him if he was nervous? Uh -huh. okay. um, after receiving these phone calls, uh, how did it make? How did that make you feel? Um, horrible. I felt um, in shock. I was um, 
not okay with it because she told something to the police that was not true, which I had no knowledge of. So I was, um, I had a really bad feeling in my stomach and I felt very shooken up by it. Okay. Do you know if the Rexford police attempted to contact you that day? They did. Okay. Uh, how did they try to contact you? They tried calling me and once I believe they left a text. Okay. And did you respond to them that day? Not the Rexburg police. I did not. Okay. How, how come? Is there a reason? Well, first of all, Chad tells me not to answer it. And then Lori tells me that her child is in danger. So I'm not sure what to believe or understand what's going on this time. I, I'm very confused. Okay. Did you speak to any law enforcement that day? Yes. Uh, what interaction did you have? Uh, do you know which law enforcement agency you spoke with that day? Gilbert Police. Okay. And do you recall if there was a specific individual you spoke with that day from Gilbert Police? Officer Ryan Pillar. I'm sorry, can you say Officer that? Ryan Pillar. Ryan Pillar. Correct. And do you know how that last name is spelled? P I L L A R, or there could be a Y. So I'm not for sure. Um, what contact did you have with uh, Officer Pillar that day? Um, he called me, left a message, and I returned his phone call. Okay. Um, what was the nature of your conversation with uh, Officer Pillar? He was responding to the Rexburg police and uh, was asking about JJ and his whereabouts. Okay. And what did you tell him? I told him that I had... I had um, been with JJ, but that he was back with Lori. Okay. Um, when you when you said you had been with him, what did what did you mean by that? That he uh, was with me, um, and then she came to get him. Okay. So that it would turn the, the, the police back to Rexburg and not with me because I, you know. Now, uh, Ms. Gibb, uh, had you recently had JJ with you? No. So when you told Detective Pillar that you had, was that an accurate statement? No, it was not. Okay. Um, and did you believe that JJ was actually with Lori at that time? I was not sure. Okay. Um, so was that, pursuant to the knowledge you had, was that an accurate statement? Yeah. Um, but you, did you also tell Detective Pillar that JJ was not with you? Correct. And was that an accurate statement? Yes. Okay. Um, is there a reason you, you told Detective Pillar you had had him? Yes, because Lori was misleading and she was manipulating me or trying to convince me that that he and she was in danger. And so because of our friendship, I thought I have really no idea if this could be true or not. And I was very perplexed, very troubled. And I really did not know what to do. I was trying to reconcile all these feelings I had. Okay. Um, did you have any subsequent uh, contact with the Gilbert Police Department? Yes. Uh, and do you recall approximately when that was? I believe it was December 7th or 8th. Okay. And what, what contact did you have with the Gilbert Police Department? I called Officer Pillar and I informed him that um, who I was and um, that probably a lot more detail about the conversation about what happened um, about JJ and Lori and Chad and I also had something that I had recorded that I wanted to give to him. Okay. Uh, let's talk about that. What had you recorded that you wanted to give to Officer Pillar? I recorded a conversation um, with Chad and Lori on Chad Daybell's phone, uh, about 21 minute conversation. Um, and that conversation was about 
where was JJ? The conversation talked about why did you tell the police that I had JJ when I got and I also explained to her my concern for her for her salvation and Chad's and that they had been very deceived and I also wanted to make sure that the police knew that I did not have anything to do with this. Okay. Uh, how did you record that conversation? On a cell phone. Um, okay. You mentioned earlier uh, the conversation was on Chad's, was with Chad's number? Correct. Was that the same number you discussed earlier? Correct. Okay. And what phone did you use to have this conversation? My phone, and then I had a recorder phone on David Warwick's, and so I put my phone on speaker, and then I recorded it with his phone. Okay. Uh, had law enforcement asked you to uh, to record a conversation with uh, Mrs. Vallow or, or Mr. Daybell? No. Okay. So this was something you did of your own accord? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you remember, and maybe you've already answered this, uh, what day you made that recording? December 8th. And where were you located when you made that recording? I was in David Warwick's home. I'm sorry, where? I was in David's home. Oh, okay, David Warwick's home. Yes. Okay, I apologize, I misheard you. Um, and again, is that the same home in Pleasant Grove, Utah? Yes. Okay. Um, Your Honor, the state would ask that state's exhibit that is marked as uh, exhibit 19 be shown to the defense and handed to the witness. Exhibit 19 is being handed to the witness. Uh, Ms. Gibb, do you recognize uh, ex the state's exhibit 19? Yes. Have you seen it before? Yes. Uh, have you uh, reviewed the contents of that disc? Yes. Um, and when did you when did you review the contents of that disc? Yesterday. Okay. And uh, what 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 is on that disc? It's the exact conversation that I recorded on my phone. Okay. And is that the same conversation you shared with law enforcement? Yes. And was it Detective Pillar that you shared that with? Yes. Okay. And the recording on that disc, is it a true and accurate representation of the original recording you made? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, the state would ask that um, State's Exhibit 19 be entered into evidence. No objection. Exhibit 19 will be admitted. Your Honor, the state would request. Exhibit 19 be published. Right, would you like to publish screen? Yes, Your Honor. Is there video and audio or just audio? Just audio. Ms. Warwick, or excuse me, Ms. Uh, Gibb, if you'll hand that exhibit to Madam Bailiff. Madam Bailiff, was there another disc in there? Yes. Will you please hand that disc to Mr. Wood so that he can identify it and we can make sure that that gets put into evidence? Your Honor, that is, um, that is State's Exhibit 14. It's no longer in the case with the marker. Okay. Your Honor, would you like me to hand this to the bailiff or? Yes, please hand it to the bailiff. Madam Bailiff, do you have the envelope that shows? Okay. Exhibit 14. All right, and Madam Bailiff, or Mr. Wood, uh, the disc that has been placed in the television at this point is Exhibit 19, is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. You're moving to publish that? Yes. 
Mr. Pryor, any objection to publishing Exhibit 19? No objection, Judge. Thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Wood. Thank you. We'll be back on the record in State versus Daybell. The court took a brief recess to cool the courtroom down, the air conditioner, as well as to allow Mr. Wood some time to get his technology ready. Mr. Wood, uh, do you wish to proceed with publishing Exhibit 19? Yes, Your Honor. You may do so. This is a recording on December 8th at 3.43 p.m. And I am calling Chad Day Bell's phone number and hopefully I will be talking to both of them, Chad and Lori. So here goes the phone call. Sweet Melanie. Hi, Chad. Hey, Lori. Hello. Hey, let me put on speaker. Oh, okay. All right. We're in the phone. <laughs> How are you guys? We're okay. How are you doing, babe? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. I was wondering, where, where are you guys? We're just hanging out. Hanging out? <laughs> are, you, are you in Idaho? We're no. in Idaho. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question, if you don't mind, Lori. Yeah, um, I wanted to know, um, you remember we talked about JJ going to Kate's house, and you told me they went there, and now he's not there? I was wondering what happened. Well, I had to move him somewhere else because of her actions so was she was she doing something like was she trying to come get him or something or like trying to kidnap him well she's yeah she said that lots of times before but um okay i well when you know when i asked chad the other day i was like hey um you know where where is jj and he said for my security he didn't want me to no, so is there a reason I should be in danger to know where he is? <laughs> no, it's nobody. It's his danger. It's the danger that there's people after me. Okay. So help if you knew, that puts you in a danger. <laughs> well, just in a bad position. Yeah, bad position. Everybody, if they don't know anything, then they don't have to say they know. Right, so you're just worried. Okay. Um, I'm just to keep him protected and and keep you protected. And keep yeah. everybody else. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, well, I was wondering why you told the police why he was with me. I just needed to use, have somebody that I, so I wouldn't have to tell them where he really was because they were going to tell Kay where he is. Oh, yeah. So is it, do you think it's like your family or, you know, like your family, your dad or? You know, well, my people. family, well, not my whole family, but you know, as you know, most of my family is working against me and yeah. with her, basically. Yeah. Is JJ safe? He is safe and happy. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Um, Are you afraid of anything? Like, are you afraid to tell me that you're just afraid that he, um, that I could be in danger? Like you're, you know, like I don't, like if I knew, like how could that hurt me? I don't understand how that could hurt me if I knew where he was. Well, I'm just not telling anybody so that nobody has to say where he is or get questioned to where he is so I can keep him as safe as possible. Yeah. Um, Okay, I hope, well, I hope that he's okay. I hope you guys are okay. I did have a question that I asked Al at one point, your brother, um, if, um, 
if I wanted to know, you know, um, like where he was. And he said, I did not want to know and that he could not be found. So what does that mean? I don't know why he would say that, but it's the same story. Like I, yeah. I, I, I don't even want Al to know. I don't want anybody to know so that nobody has to be worried about it. I mean, nobody has to be yeah. questioned about it so he can be safe. Yeah. So are you, I mean, are you, how, how long are you going to be away for? Like how, I mean, are you ever going to be able to come out and come back to society again? Or are you going to keep, you know, like come back? I mean, like, what does that look like? I will do whatever the Lord needs me to do every day. So okay. I just wondered if I was ever going to see you again. Absolutely. You will. Okay. So, yeah. so maybe when they're done, chasing you, you'll be able to come out of, will they able to come out again, or? Yeah, I mean, it's a ridiculous thing for them to be working with Kay to find me. There's nothing that's going on that, you know what I'm saying? Like, they're working with her in some dark capacity. The police yeah. are working with her in some mm -hmm. dark capacity. There's no reason for them to be after me mm -hmm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, has she has she threatened you at all? Yes, lots of times. Oh boy, like did she, what did she say? Well, it's in emails and everything. So, mm. so like she said she was gonna come take him, or she was. There's a lot of things. Yeah, Nellie. Well, I know it sounds like it. I'm just worried for you guys because you know he's missing. And you know, <laughs> I know exactly right. where he is. He's perfectly okay. fine. And happy. Okay. Well, I hope so. I have, I have a scripture I wanted to share with you, if you don't mind. I love it. I was thinking about some of the things you guys have gone through, and I saw the scripture today, and I wanted to I want you to comment. Let me ask you a question. Let okay. me ask you a question yeah. about scripture. Okay. okay. So, did Alma turn himself into King Noah? Or what did, was he required to do? Well, King Noah was incredibly wicked. Yes. And so he he fled his his evil ways, which is with which was adultery and and right living riotously and breaking all the commandments. Right. So what did he? What was he required to do, Alma? He had to go and flee so that he would um, be safe and then help other people realize how you know jacked up the system was and the government was. What about? Moroni, what was he required to do at the end? To to carry on those plates and bury them. That was what did he have to do to do that? What did he have to do to do that? Did well, he hide? He had to hide. He, he had to hide because they were so. Um, oh. They were so. Um, everybody was killing everybody in the society. Everybody was dying. They were killing all the new guys. Felt in the scriptures had to hide in the cavity of a rock by day. And go out by night. The, prophet, the prophets. The prophets did. They did. Yeah. Okay. So well, thank you for sharing that with me. Okay. I just that this scripture is just something that may be thoughtful for you. For behold, this is Doctrine and Covenants section three, verse seven and eight. It says, For behold, you should not have feared man more than God, although men set not the counsels of God and despise his words. Yet you should have been faithful, and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary. He would have been with you in every trouble. So when we work with the Lord and are obedient, he has, he's going to protect us from adversarial darts and all kinds of negativity. But when we open the door to Satan, he comes in and then he attacks and then he takes away to make it look like somebody else took it away. But that's not how God works. He doesn't work in darkness. I agree with you a hundred percent. And that's what the Lord is doing for me. Exactly what he's doing for me. Oh, it just, it just, it just we have not weird. opened the door for darkness, Mel. Darkness is knocking on the door all the time because that's the way dark works with the light. And I promise you that I have done nothing wrong in this case, but sometimes you have to hide in the cavity of a rock for your own life safety. And that's what the Lord requires of you sometimes. And that's how it is. And I'm sorry that's how it is.
It is, because there is a lot of darkness on the earth. I know. Okay. This. After me for zero reason, besides the darkness of Kay, which you already know she's dark. I, I, ha I haven't met her enough to know if she's dark or not. I've just met her slightly, and she seemed like a normal kind of person, but then I haven't engaged with her that much, so I don't know that personally. So you don't know about her changing the thing to for herself to be the beneficiary of the policy and all that stuff. None of that's dark, right? Well, I haven't seen those documents, so I have no way of knowing. You've seen them on my computer. No, I have not. I haven't even looked in on your computer before. You haven't shown me anything. I don't know why you're being controversial to me or if you're recording this conversation for the police or whatever. I don't know what your intention is on this phone call. No, but no. with all my heart, and I have forever, and no. I will always... I appreciate those words, but if you really loved me, you wouldn't have told the police that I had Jeju with me. That's not that's not what a friend does. I mean, that just makes me look weird, and it it just it's not safe for me. That doesn't look good. I mean, you had to think of my welfare if you loved me. I do, and I did exactly what I felt the Lord was instructing me to do. And I appreciate you, and I love you. And I never do anything to harm you, and you can have all of this confirmed to you by the Lord. I have, and my my conscience is clear. I feel very understanding what's really going on, Lori. And I believe that, look, I believe that you have been very deceived by Satan. I believe that he has tricked you, and I just I don't believe that what you're doing is correct i just don't i mean tammy dies and then your husband died and then he's and then he's missing it just doesn't sound like god's plan to me it just sounds it gives me a gut feeling like in my gut it feels weird it doesn't feel right i don't have peace about it i never have felt 100 percent peace about it i always felt like a little weird in my stomach about all these things you know me mel you know me this does not sound like you. This sounds like you've been influenced by somebody dark who wants you to believe dark things and have fear, and have fear of the celestial world. I don't have fear. You obviously do. No, I have a piece of conscience and I can see clearly. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I love you so much. I know you do. I don't know what else to say. Stand Christ when he comes again, and he's coming soon, and we will all stand there, and you will know at that point that he has supported me and has supported me the whole time, and I have not been deceived. I just want to testify that I I know Tammy was at the conspiracy theories. My sister-in-law's right behind it all, and I hope that you're not being influenced by that. Dark team. I don't know who she is. I'm sorry, you oh, said your sister in law? I don't even know her. Oh, I know, but she's coming up with the same type of theories. Mm -hmm. And it's just not true. My own children were there. They testified that Tammy had been getting weaker and sick. And I begged her to go to the doctor. There's, she just, her heart was failing her. She was physically falling apart, but she hates doctors. And mm -hmm. She just passed away. Um, that's how it happened. My son Garth was right there with me the whole time. My kids were with, at the house within 20 minutes of her passing. Like, there were two coroners. They checked her out right there on the bed. All these conspiracy theories just make me sick to my stomach. Uh, just absolutely sick. I know it's been told three years that Tammy would pass away at a young age. I had no idea that Lori would even be a part of my life. I just knew that I, my life had two segments. And that I know Tammy's on a special mission and she's with my kids. She's visited them. Just, there's so much, Melody, that you, you just have to have faith. And this is not some sort of master plan. There's no way Lori and I could ever come up with this. It's just... You can understand my concern, correct? 
I can from an outside perspective, but from an... From someone who knows as much as you know? No, not really. But we can feel Dave's influence on you. I can feel that for sure. He's a very good man, and he has a very strong foundation that I know. I know, but he seems to be the one that's putting the doubts in your mind. No, no, but the, you know what? I have, I have come to understand that my gut feeling, I was not listening to it. And I always felt uncomfortable with uh, many things. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that I included you in those teachings then for your own sake, because I wish that you didn't have as much knowledge as you have, as you will be accountable for the knowledge that you do have, Mom. So will you. I agree so 100%. Yeah, so 100%. I have no fear. Yeah. I have no fear of that. Yeah. But I really, I, you know, as I was, I was reading the story of Korahor, and it is so very similar to this, you just can't see it, but he did it because... He was trying to reclaim a people, and he thought at the very end, because of his carnal and natural desires, that's what influenced him. And he was very, that's very carnal natural desires. Well, honey, you got a lot of natural desires. We all know that. That's what you think is me, Korahor? Are you kidding me right now? I think both of you have hey, had similar, right similarities. It's in the scriptures. It's in the scriptures, and the scriptures are very powerful. Yes, they are. I live by the scriptures, as you know. I know, but we can rest the scriptures for our own vain glory. I rested the scriptures? We can. We can do that, and I feel that you have to I see thought... our, our belief systems. Do I rest the scriptures? Is that what you're accusing me of at this point? I feel that you have. How? Why do you feel that way? I need an explanation on this. Because if you look, like the scripture just shared. Okay, the scriptures. scriptures every single day, you know? I, I, oh, I know you read them. I know about that. But, but this scripture right here says that you will be supported by all against the fiery darts of the adversary. You would have been supported if you had not opened dark portals and dark junk. You would have been safe if you would have opened. Thank God, he would have had your back, but you have been chased like, and tortured. Was there to do this or not? I'm sorry? He had back. So, well, if he has your back, you would not not be able to tell me where you are. And we couldn't find JJ. Like, where is he? I've been asking, where is he? And you know what I mean? Like, that's. that's I can tell everything where JJ is right now. And that would not be good for JJ. So I'm sorry that you don't want me to protect my children. But I would never ask you to not protect your children. Of course you wouldn't. So I can tell that you're just adversarial, Mel. I love you. I'm sorry that you feel no, this way. Because I actually do care. I'm sharing what I feel for you because I know your salvation's in trouble for what you've done. Okay, my salvation is not in trouble at all. And I think you should check that with the Lord again. Oh, well, I, I, I felt a lot of things from the Lord. And this doesn't feel right. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way, sweetheart. I'm sorry that you are friends with all those who are against me. Joseph Smith's friends I'm turned not, against me. I'm not a friend. I'm not friends with people that are against you. Apparently, you are. I am not. I don't know Kay. I don't know who you're talking about. Your sister, I don't even know what her name or who she is. I don't know any of those people. Why would they contact me anyway? How would I even know about that? Well, you're friends with Dave, and he's well, apparently me well, now. Well, David is a very righteous man, and um, I've always known that grounding about him. And he has a lot of beautiful experiences with the Lord, and these are not the same. You know, when you get the priesthood, that's Peter, James, and John shows up, and then he confirms all of those in the circle that are to get it, and everybody's a witness of that. Everybody's a witness that the pattern is in the scriptures. There's no witness that you ever receive what you think you receive. Nobody has seen that but you. There's no witness. The witness, Joseph Smith, Oliver Calvary, Martin Harris, the eight witnesses, they all showed up. Is there a witness that witness. Jesus, Heavenly Father, gave that to Joseph Smith by himself in the grove? Was there a witness? No, but they had no. it later with other people. That was one experience, but others joined in later. When he brought other people into it, they had experiences. Is that in the scriptures, yes or no? I'm sorry? Is that in the scriptures, yes or no? 
That that Joseph was alone when he saw God the Father and Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes, he was alone. He was alone. But he okay. had to open it up for us. That's not a pattern at all. Honey, what I'm saying is, is that after he saw that and other people joined in, they saw the things with him. He wasn't alone. There was a witness for them. There was no witness. Anybody's never seen what you've seen or experienced what you've seen. That's your own witness, but nobody said that. You no, know, God knows it, and I will never deny it. For my soul would be at stake if I did. So you can say it didn't happen to me, Mel, but if I say it, then I am accountable. You didn't witness it. Okay, but, I did. but your behaviors I, is not so okay. Describes. I understand that's what you, you believe you saw, but this is the thing as I see is that your behavior is not one of somebody Never, Christ. Your behavior. Your behavior. Person. What? Never had any idea that you would be the person of all people to turn me. I cannot believe I am that. asking questions and I am concerned for you. That is what somebody does when they care. You don't sound like you're concerned. You sound like you're accusatory. You do not sound concerned. You sound pissed off. I'm not. I am very. I am troubled. Maybe that's the better word. Troubled. Because these things, like you being with Chad before he's even divorced, is unusual behavior for a person that's seen it's Jesus not, Christ. I was never with him, and he was never divorced. Honey, I've seen you guys together. Oh, so I haven't, haven't ever seen you with, I've never seen you with Chad kiss him and walk around the track at BYU with him. I never saw that. You say you are the one that's just feeling guilty about being with someone before they were divorced. Oh, honey. I think that's not what we're talking about here. Wait, it's not what we're talking about here. That's what I'm saying. You are going off the deep end. But well, I'm just saying this is not a behavior of someone that sees Jesus Christ. It's not the behavior. Really? Have really? you ever seen Jesus Christ? So do you know what the future behavior would be if you had seen Jesus Christ? I know no. that when I I know that every, when I pray. Lord asks me to do every day, and He does protect me, and He is protecting me, and He will protect me against this accusation as well. And we will both stand there with Him. And you tell me if I was lying or not. But we're both standing there with Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, Skip, was that the natural ending of that conversation? I'm sorry? Was that, was that how that conversation ended? The phone cut off. I could have been because it was in a basement apartment. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, the state has no further questions at this time. Mr. Pryor, looks like we have about 10 minutes until 5 o'clock. Can you give me an idea of uh, how long you foresee the cross-examination taking here? Judge, I anticipate much more than 10 minutes. Um, I spoke with Mr. Wood and I, we thought it was best if, if the court would oblige us and then forego the next 10 minutes and allow me to start my cross in the morning. If that's acceptable to the court, I would respectfully ask that. We will recess for the day. Um, we'll reconvene tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Ms. Gibb, if you'll please come forward. Ms. Gibb, with a new day, we'll swear you in here again. Ms. Gibb, you can be seated there in that witness chair. If you'll pull that microphone up to your chin and aim it at your chin again. Uh, Mr. Pryor, you may inquire on cross-examination when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Pryor, uh, in looking at the some of the recording last night, I noticed that the, the one audio that we couldn't hear very well was yours. So again, if you don't mind making your microphone look like this, it will record it a lot better if it's pointed at your chin. I know it looks weird. That's the way to do it. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? I can. And Ms. Gibbs, can you hear me as well? Yes. Okay. Ms. Gibbs, um, Ms. Gibbs, I'm, I apologize. When did you first meet uh, Mr. Davo? 
um, about, I think, two or three years ago. Okay. If I reflect, just, uh, the information I have is that you were at a preparedness camp in July of 2017 in Ogden, Utah. Is that correct? In Morgan, Utah. Yes, that's is correct. Morgan, Utah? Mm -hmm. Is Morgan close to Ogden? Yes. Okay. Okay. And, and would you explain to me what a preparedness camp is? Uh, it was Objection a camp. relevance. Mr. Pryor has been an objection as to relevance. Well, Judge, there was testimony that they met. I, I think I can inquire as to the nature of that relationship and what they were both there for. And, and, and uh, I don't think it's necessarily irrelevant. There's a discussion. It's much like we went to a concert or we, we, we went to a play. It's, it's the same thing. I think I'm allowed to inquire about that. I don't see that that's necessarily irrelevant. I'll overrule the objection. You may continue with that question, Mr. Pryor. And again, ma'am, before Mr. Wood injected his uh, objection, uh, there was a uh, question about what is a preparedness camp? It's a camp where people get together, families and individuals, where they're learning about um, how to cook outside or how to filter water or different preparedness skills. Preparedness for what? For if there's times where you may not have um, those types of things readily available to you that you could learn to do it if you, you know, didn't have electricity, things like that. Okay. Well, I noticed when I was listening to your tape, and I've, obviously I've heard that before, there were some religious references in, on that tape with, between you and Miss Vallow. And um, I'm just curious as to whether this preparedness camp has any kind of a religious undertone as well. Objection, well, relevance. Overruled. I think there was a lot of religious undertones that were put forth yesterday. I'm going to allow Mr. Pryor to go down this road uh, in a limited way here today and right. allow that question. And again, uh, there was a religious undertone, and I don't want to go into complete detail about this, and it's not necessary. But I would like you to explain uh, what is in your mind the religious nature of these preparedness camps. Your client was one of those people that spoke at that, and he was okay, expressing well, his visions judge, and dreams. I'm going to move to strike. The question is, is what's the religious undertone? It's not what my client participated, ma'am. It's what is the undertone of this? So I, I'd like you to answer my question as opposed to pushing some blame on my client. So would you answer the question? Objection. This is argumentative. Hold up. We're going to take a time out here. Um, Mr. Pryor, I want you to ask the question. Ms. Gibb, I want you to answer the question that Mr. Pryor is asking you. Um, I'm not going to tell you how to answer that question, but I want you to listen carefully to the question that he asks. Understand, after Mr. Pryor asks you these questions, Mr. Wood will get a chance to offer any redirect if he, if he deems that's necessary, which can often provide clarification, but I want you to listen carefully to the question that's being asked of you and answer only that question. Mr. Pryor, you can ask the question again. So I noticed you just took a look at Mr. Wood. Is there a reason why you just did that? I looked around. Oh, you looked around? Mm -hmm. okay. I didn't actually look at his face. Okay. Just over in that direction. So why don't you tell me what the religious nature of this preparedness camp is, ma'am? People sharing their spiritual experiences, okay. scriptural base to personal dreams. Does it have a specific religious affiliation in, in this religious preparedness camp? People that belong to our church. What church is that, ma'am? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So you represent yourself as an LDS person, is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. And the first opportunity for you to meet Mr. Daybell was in July of 2017. Did you have a face-to-face -face meeting with him? Yes. Okay, did you discuss anything in particular? Yes. I'm sorry, Judge, I heard some voices in the corner and I, I, it, it distracted me, I apologize. And then uh, did you have any contact with him uh, prior to the July 18th uh, uh, organi organization that you went to in Mesa, Arizona? I'm not sure. Okay, so you don't have any recollection of whether you spoke to him again between July of 2017 and July of 2018, is that correct? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And then you were at some sort of an organization in July of 2018, is that right? I'm sorry, 2018? In Mesa, Arizona. I'm just checking my mind with my dates. I believe so. Okay. 
Is there anything that you have in terms of a medical condition that, that affects your ability to recollect anything, ma'am? No. Is there any condition such as an auditory disorder that you've been diagnosed with that affects your ability to understand and hear things? No. You've never been medically diagnosed with an auditory disorder? No. Okay. At some point you met Lori Vallow, is that correct? Correct. Uh, and when was that? October, 2018. Did you meet Chad Daybell at the same time? No. That was a different occasion. And where did you meet Ms. Vallow, ma'am? In Mesa, Arizona at a, a church building. Okay, and what was the nature of the proceeding that you were at? Was it a preparedness camp again? No, it was a um, held by the church, inside the church, about preparedness type of um, classes that they asked me to speak on. Okay, and, and, um, and this was uh, the church that was supporting this preparedness uh, situation was to, uh, was part of the LDS church, is that correct? Yes, but these groups are separate. I'm sorry, say that again? These groups are not affiliated with each other. Okay. Okay, but it was at an LDS church yeah. and it was an LDS sponsored event, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, was Mr. Daybell there? No. Okay. And then uh, on July of 18th, when you met him in Mesa, Arizona, when is the next time that you met him? I met him, we saw each other in October, 2018, um, probably a week or two after I met Lori. Okay. And um, that was in St. George? Yes. And what was the nature of that uh, meeting? Where was that taking place at? In a church as well? No, I think it was in an elementary school. Okay. And what was the nature of that uh, uh, meeting? What, what was it was a, a variety of speakers. Okay. Uh, and what was the topics? Um, we had some talking about science. We had some talking about Book of Mormon evidence. Okay. We had some talking about uh, their dreams of visions. Okay. And um, were you a speaker at that as well? No. Um, there's a gentleman's name who came up, and it, it's uh, Mr. Warwick. You mentioned him a couple of times yes. yesterday. What's your relationship with Mr. Warwick? He's my boyfriend. Okay. Are you two living together? Objection relevance. Sustained. Do you know where Mr. Warwick lives? Yes. Where does he live? He lives in Utah. Where in Utah? Pleasant Grove. Okay, where do you live now? Gilbert, Arizona. Okay. And that's your permanent address in Gilbert, Arizona? Correct. And again, the, uh, uh, the October 26th at St. George, did that have religious overtones as well? Yes. And, and that was also somewhat sponsored by the LDS church, is that correct? Not by the church, by individuals. Okay. But the, the theme of that was consistent with what your uh, uh, religious faith is, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And are you telling me that on October 26th, Mr. Daybell was there as well? Yes. Okay. If you could speak a little closer to your mic. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank, Thank you, you for telling me that. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Daybell, do you recall what his topic was at that time on October of 2018? Yes, he talked about the different visions he had of what he saw was going to happen in the last okay. days. Is that something that interested you? Yes. Is that something that's inconsistent with your religious beliefs? No. Okay. So it's something that's consistent with your religious beliefs. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. And then at some point, do you have a recollection when Mr. Daybell and, and Lori Vallow met? Yes. And you were present for that meeting, is that correct? Yes. And was that in, um, uh, was that in Arizona? No, as you recall, I said St. George, Utah. That was, oh, that was on the 26th of 2018 in St. George, what? that's correct, okay. Uh, so you had known Ms. Vallow at that point for how long? A few weeks. Okay. Did you uh, form a friendship? Yes. Was it an immediate friendship? Yes. Would you describe, uh, obviously I, I, I heard some of your testimony uh, uh, 
on that tape, but uh, from that time in October until, you know, maybe the beginning of last year, you had a very close friendship. Would that be fair? Yes. Sisters. Possibly. Well, possibly, or were you that close? We were close. Okay. You shared a number of things. Yes. You shared your belief about having visions about things that may happen in the future, correct? Not my visions, not her visions. Okay. Okay. But you're not in disbelief about having visions about things, are you? I'm not in disbelief. Right. Okay. Can you tell me how many times you spoke with the uh, Gilbert Police Department? Oh, multiple times, maybe five or six. Okay. Do you have a recollection of the first time you spoke with the Gilbert Police Department? I believe it was December. I'm sorry, in person or on phone? On the phone. On phone. Um, I believe it was December 7th or 8th. Is it possible that in November, Officer Pillar left you a phone message to get back to him and call him? In November. Yes. Okay. And then in November, you didn't call him back right away. Is that correct? Correct. And then at some point, you did have contact with him. Did you initiate the contact or did Officer Gilbert initiate the contact? Well, he first initiated it, and then I secondly initiated it. So you called him back. Uh, correct. Some, some time after he had called you, correct? That's correct. How much time passed between when he left the message and when you got back to him? I would say within an hour, possibly. Okay. And then at some point, there was a question regarding the whereabouts of, of JJ. Is that right? Correct. And at that point, you had uh, advised him that uh, you had had JJ in your care, correct? I told him that I had him, and then I didn't have him. Okay. So the initial time that you told him that you had JJ, that was not a truthful statement to, to Officer Pillar, was it? Correct. And when you tell a statement that's, that's not accurate to a police officer, that's, that's a lie, is it not? Correct. So you lied to a police officer, is that correct? Correct. And then at some point, how long between the time when you told that lie to the police officer regarding the whereabouts of J.J. Vallow, did you correct your lie? How much time passed? Till I spoke to him on December 6th, I believe. I could be off a day or two. So, um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, but I want an accurate reflection of, of the amount of time that we're talking about. The initial call from Officer Gilbert occurred sometime in late November. Did you have any reason to disagree with that, ma'am? No. And then the time when you decided to uh, uh, tell Officer Gilbert the truth, or at least what you think the truth is, uh, was sometime in December, the 6th of December. Correct. So approximately 10 to 12 days passed from the time you told your first lie to when you decided to come up with a different story for Officer Gilbert later on, correct? Correct. Okay. So at least at that point, we have two phone calls with Officer Gilbert, correct? correct. Officer Gilbert, Officer Pillar, I'm sorry, I apologize. Officer Pillar, I can't get Gilbert, Arizona out of my mind. Mm -hmm. Officer Pillar. Mm -hmm. When was the next time you spoke with Officer Pillar? Maybe the next day. And what was the purpose of that phone call? We were just trying to make arrangements to get together. To discuss the case? Correct. And where did you make arrangements to discuss the case? In his office in Gilbert, Arizona. Okay, and when did you have that office visit with him? Do you recall? I know I've, I have it written down. I cannot recall right now. It's on my phone, though. Was it, was it a significant amount of time, or was it a brief time? Well, I was in Utah at the time. Where were so you, he where was, were you he, in Utah? Oh, hold up. So, so uh, Mr. Pryor, you're interrupting the witness before she can answer I the apologize, questions. Your Honor. I, I, we're making a, a record here, so it's crucial that nobody talk over each other. So, Mr. Pryor, I want you to make a, 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 an effort here to let the witness can finish the answer before you ask the next question. And, Ms. Gibb, if you'll make sure he finishes the question before you start to answer. Okay. So the last thing I heard is that you were in Utah, and I did interrupt you. I apologize for that. It's okay. Uh, where were you in Utah? 
I was at David Warwick's home in Pleasant Grove, Utah. How long had you been there? A few days, I can't recall. And do you recall what the approximate date is when you were there? I'm sorry? The approximate date when you were there, ma'am? Um, I, I don't have those dates memorized right now. Okay, okay. But at some point, you then had a, an in face to face conversation with Officer Pillar of the Gilbert Police. When I arrived home from my trip to Utah, I immediately went there that day. I didn't even go home first. Okay. And how long was the conversation with Officer uh, Pillar? I would say at least two hours. Okay. Did he advise you whether or not that was a recorded conversation? I believe he did. He said it was a recorded conversation? I believe so, but I can't exactly recall. Okay. And then did you have another visit with him at a later time after that? I did. Okay, when was that, ma'am? I can't recall the time, but it, it was probably a few weeks. A few weeks later? Okay. And again, was that a recorded conversation as an infer? Was that a recorded conversation? I don't know for sure, but it could have been. Was it an in-person discussion? Yes. Who else was present for that meeting? The second meeting, I believe it was just Officer Pryor or Pillar, sorry. Pillar. <laughs> and then at some point, were you interviewed by the, uh, the, the Rexburg Police Department? Um, a little bit. When you say a little bit, can you just tell me what that means? I just had a brief conversation, and then he told me to just contact Gilbert Police to tell the whole story. Okay. Did you have any other visits with the Gilbert Police Department after that, the last one you spoke of? Yes. Okay. When was the next one? Oh, could have been like a month or two later. I can't recall. And at any time, did you have a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, meeting with anybody from the Rexburg Police Department? Uh, not until just a few months ago when they came down to speak to me. Okay. And who came down to speak with you? Um, Detective Ball and Detective Permacio and Rob Woods. Right. So at that point, do you recall what that date of that meeting was? I believe it was in June. Okay. But I can't recall the date. Okay. And again, that meeting, uh, Officer Hermosillo was present? Correct. Uh, did Officer Hermosillo say that he was recording that conversation? I do not know. Did he ever, do you recall whether he told you that? I can't recall. Did Lieutenant Ball say he was recording the conversation? I cannot recall. Okay. Mr. Wood was present for a discussion with you in June as well, because he was present for that meeting. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Did they, then the topic of discussion was Lori Vallow? It was everybody. Okay. And everybody meaning Lori Vallow, correct? Correct. Chad Daybell? Correct. Alex Cox? Correct. Was there also a discussion about uh, potential difficulties you might have as a result of lying to the Gilbert Police Department? No. There was never any reference or any offer of any um, deal to testify about anything and, and they would forego going after you for lying to a police officer? No. And you've never been offered anything by anyone in regards to uh, the fact that you lied about uh, or at least you, you objection imagine. asked and answered. Mr. Pryor. I judge it's a different question. It's a I, slightly different question. I'll allow you to ask the question. So again, Mr. Wood has never specifically offered you any deal to testify in any manner in this case. Is that correct? Never. Okay. And when you came into town, when did you arrive in town this week? Saturday. Okay. Did you have a meeting with Mr. Wood prior to testifying today? Yes. Did he tell you what to say on the stand? No. Did he coach you in any way? No. Did he ask you to testify in a certain manner or wear a certain amount of clothes a certain way? No. He didn't tell you anything. 
We talked about a lot of things. Well, that's what I'm trying to get into. It wasn't the weather, was it, ma'am? No. It was about how and what you were going to say in this hearing today, correct? He asked me questions and I gave him answers. Do you know whether or not that recording, that, that conversation was recorded or not? I have no idea. So if what you're telling me is that um, before, when you arrived here on Saturday, you had a meeting with Mr. Wood, who else was present for that meeting? Uh, David Warwick and two of uh, the women he works with. Okay, two of the women Mr. Warwick works with? No, Rob Woods. Okay, so his staff was there as well? Correct. Okay, was any law enforcement officer there? Probably, yes. Um, I saw Detective Hermosillo and some of the detectives, I didn't know their name and I didn't know their titles, but I, I know they told me, I just can't recall all the people. And when you say probably, the, the, the answer is there were other officers there, correct? Yes. And how many other officers, and you don't need to give me their names, but how many in their number were in this, this, this place where you were being interviewed? I cannot recall. There was several people going in and out. It was a, a busy kind and of a movement. This, Sorry again. And where did this interview take place? Um, in the Madison County Courthouse. Okay. At the prosecutor's office? Yes. So if I understand this correctly, that uh, you you spoke to numerous law enforcement officers about your testimony. Mr. Wood and uh, objection. He's misstating your testimony. Mr. Pryor. Well, there have been at least four or five test discussions with uh, um, Officer Pillar, is that correct? I'm sorry? Officer Pillar, how many times have you Your Honor, I, mis I misunderstood his question, never mind. Okay. I'll withdraw my objection. Okay. Mr. Pryor, please proceed. You, you've had numerous discussions with law enforcement officers, is that correct? Yes, if you could speak a little closer to your mic. Okay, I will. Other than Officer Hermosillo and Officer Ball, and Officer, Pil Officer Pillar from the Gilbert Police Department, have you spoken to anybody with the FBI? Yes. And how many times did you speak with the FBI? Maybe two or three times. When were those, ma'am? Oh. Hmm. Sometime in 20 and sometime in the beginning of the year, I cannot recall the dates. All right, so sometime in 2020, that's a very broad range. Are you, having, are you having difficulty remembering when you spoke with an FBI agent? Yes. And is it, is, is it your common practice to regularly speak with FBI agents? Is that why you can't remember that you spoke with one? Objection compound. And argumentative. Sustained on the argumentative. Uh, Mr. Pryor, if you'll uh, divide your questions so that we can get one answer per question. You testified that sometime in 2020 you spoke with the FBI. Did you speak to him in um, August of 2020? I can't recall. Okay. August? That would be this month. That would be. So that's why I'm trying to wonder whether or not you you can't recall because there's I didn't I didn't know. I didn't speak to anybody in August. Okay, did you speak to anybody in July of 2020? I don't think so. Okay. June of 2020. I'm sorry? June of 2020, did you speak to the FBI? Probably not, but I can't recall. Okay. Did you speak to the FBI in May of 2020? I can't recall. Do you have any recollection of any month that you may have spoken to the FBI? No. Okay. So you don't remember even talking to them? I remember talking to them. You just don't know what month it was? I want to be accurate, so I don't remember. Okay. Okay. So in 2019, do you have a more distinct recollection of when you spoke with the FBI? No. Okay. Was it an uneventful discussion? Is that why you don't remember it? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Was it an uneventful discussion? Is that why you don't remember it? I just can't recall the time because it didn't have any significance of a certain, it was on the phone. So I just, I don't, I don't remember the date. Oh, you've never had a face-to-face -face discussion with the FBI? No. It's always been on the phone? Correct. Okay. Do you keep your phone records? Mostly, yes. Okay. And you have your phone records available for the last couple of years? 
I don't think they date back that long. I want to switch gears a little bit, if we may, and I'd like to talk about Alex Cox. How would you describe your relationship with Alex Cox? Um, a friend, friendly with each other. How many times did you meet Al Alex Cox? Multiple times, I cannot recall. When is the first time you met Alex Cox? Shortly after meeting Lori. Um, between October and November 2018. Okay. How would you describe the relationship based on the knowledge that you have of uh, between Alex Cox and Lori uh, Vallow? I'm sorry, the relationship yeah. I have or they How, have? They have, the two of them. Oh, those two together? Um, they were good friends and, and, and siblings to each other. Um, they got along really well. Well, they were very close with each other, were they not? Yes. In fact, isn't it true that uh, um, when they moved from um, Arizona to Idaho, Alex moved as well. Isn't that true? Correct. And in fact, he tried to get an apartment right next to Lori's. Isn't that correct? I believe so. All right. And he actually gave up a job so that he could be with Lori in Idaho. Is that correct? I don't know if he gave it up. Okay. Did he do that previously as well? In, t in Texas or something like that? Do you have any recollection of that? I don't know. But so when you described they have a close relationship, it was a little more than close. They were extremely close, weren't they? Objection, speculative. There's no speculation. It's a, it's a specific question. Ms. Were they Gibb, extremely close? Ms. Gibb, I'm going to authorize the question to be answered if you know the answer to that question. I would say yes. Okay. <clears throat> now you um, listened to the tape recording that you recorded. Uh, and that was in, uh, what was that? No, was that December of uh, last year? Is that correct, that tape recording? The one, the 21-minute record with Lori? Yeah, December 8th. Okay. You remember the date? I did. Okay. Were you prompted by law enforcement to, uh, to make that phone call? Nope. You did that on your own? Yep. And the questions you asked were questions that you uh, planned ahead of time to ask Lori about what was going on, correct? Correct. And you, you planned this as a means of trying to gain some information uh, uh, to somehow uh, either clarify things for you, correct? Partially correct. I had many objectives in that, and that okay. was one of them. Okay. To show my innocence. Okay. And one of the other objectives, and we'll talk about that, is to impress upon the police that you did nothing wrong. Is that correct? Correct. And you needed to prove to the police that you were innocent of, of no wrongdoing. Is that correct? That wasn't my full objective. But it was one of the objectives, wasn't it? Yes. Now, I, I took the liberty of listening to that tape a number of times, and I found something quite interesting is that... Uh, Lori Vallow said on the tape that she would not um, tell anything to Al. When she said she would not tell anything to Al, who, which, who's the Al she's talking about? Her brother. That would be Alex Cox? Correct. And she also talked about not telling you anything as well, correct? Correct. And you two were more than close friends. You were almost sisters with Lori Vallow, weren't you? We were really close. Well, were you almost sisters? Would you describe it as that close? Um, possibly. Okay. Is there a reason why you're not saying yes? Well, it's just a big word to say you're sisters with somebody. I haven't known her for very long, so it's only right. been a few months. Okay. But you knew her long enough to make that phone call to try to get her to help you clear your name, right? Partially. Okay. Now, would you describe Lori as someone who's a persuasive person? Yes. And she's got quite a dynamic personality, doesn't she? Yes. And she's very convincing, isn't she? Yes. And if she says that she would not discuss anything with any of her children or the whereabouts with anybody close to her, would that be a fair statement? Yes. 
So she would, no matter who it is, she would uh, probably refrain from giving out any information if it served her purpose. Objection, Correct. speculative. Calls for facts, not in evidence. Sustained. <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit and, and switch gears a little bit. Um, you went down to, uh, or, excuse me, went down. You, you came to uh, Rexburg uh, around the 19th of September, is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, part of your visit, you brought your boyfriend at the time, David Warwick, correct? He met me there. Okay, you guys met there. Correct. And then you were staying in, um, and I've, I've had an opportunity to go through all of the police reports and all the evidence, but you were staying in Lori Vallow's apartment. Is that correct? Correct. And you and David were staying in Tylee's room, if, from what I understand the statements that were previously given. Is that correct? I was. Oh, where was David staying? In JJ's room. Okay. Now, and, and obviously correct me if I'm wrong, but... Um, you had a, a poor relationship with Tylee, and, and isn't that correct? I would say I had pretty much a no relationship with Tylee. Right. She didn't care. Well, all right, I want to strike this because I don't want to misrepresent. Both of you weren't particularly fond of each other. Is that correct? Objection we asked and answered. Not. That hasn't been asked and answered, Judge. Overruled. I'll allow the question. You and Tylee were not particularly fond of each other. Is that correct? I don't know how she felt about me, but I did not have a relationship with her. I would not say that. Okay. Okay. But it's no, it's no surprise that uh, she didn't necessarily want to be around you, did she? Objection calls for speculation. Sustained. You could really care less whether you were around her as well. Isn't that true, ma'am? Not necessarily. Okay. Well, if it's not necessarily, does that mean yes, no, or, or you just don't want to answer? Objection argumentative. Sustained. How would you describe your relationship with Tylee other than not at all? Did you care to be around her or not? Very Objection little. Objection asked and answered. Okay. Sustained. I'm, fine, I'm going to move on. How would you describe your relationship with JJ? Um, I tried to communicate, but he didn't reciprocate, so there was not a relationship. Okay. He was... Uh, he was autistic, obviously, right? Correct. And you're you're familiar with that as well. You you uh, share with Lori the uh, um, the job of caring for autistic children as well. Do you not? Objection. Correct. Relevance. I, I repeat the question for me, Mr. Pryor. You share the uh, the job and the obligation of caring for an autistic child as well. Do you not, Miss uh, Miss Gibb? I'd also renew the objection on the grounds that it's beyond the scope of the direct. I don't know how far you're going to go along this, this road, Mr. Pryor. I'll allow that one question, uh, but as far as relevance goes, I, I agree. You're bordering on the relevant. All right. You share that with uh, Ms. Fallow as you have an autistic child as well, do you not, ma'am? Correct. Okay. Now, that child was also interviewed by the police about the whereabouts of, uh, of um, um, J.J. Vallow. Do you recall that? Yes. Were you present for that? No. Okay. You chose not to be? I was in Utah. Okay. He was in Gilbert. So the Gilbert police approached him and interviewed him about, to your knowledge, about uh, the whereabouts of JJ? They asked him questions. Okay. Do you, do you have any recollection as to whether or not he cooperated with the officers? He says he had a short visit with them. Okay. And when did he say that short visit was? Objection here, sir. Sustained. Okay. To your recollection, were you ever present when the, your son and J.J. Vallow had a short visit at the time period that he was talking about, ma'am? They never had a visit during that period. Okay. So that was not a truthful statement that your son made to the, the Gilbert Police My department. son did not Objection understand the question. Objection calls for hearsay. It's not calling for hearsay. That's just asking whether or not she believes it was a truthful statement to the police department about her son saying she had a visit with J.J. Vallow when it didn't happen. Your Honor, he's just trying to sneak in a, a statement of of a, someone who's not here in the courtroom. It's it's calls for hearsay. Sustained. Okay, I'm going to move on, Judge. Thank you. You left on the 23rd of September. Is that right? Correct. Okay. 
And at that time, you didn't see um, uh, Tylee at all. Is that correct? Correct. Now, on the Sunday, the 22nd, did, did David and Chad go to, uh, to deal with some real estate matters together? I did as well. And oh. so Alex was there too. Oh, that was news to me. I wasn't aware you went as well. Where did you guys go? We went to a lot that was close to Mr. Daybell's home. And, and what time was that? Do you recall? It was sometime in the afternoon. I don't recall exactly. Okay. You, uh, sometime meaning between 12 and 5 or 6? I would say either late morning or early afternoon. Okay. And the purpose of that was to, to for what, ma'am? Um, Chad wanted to um, show this piece of land to David, and he encouraged him to consider building on that land. Okay. Is, is your, is your, it's your boyfriend. Is your boyfriend um, in the real estate business now? General contractor. General contractor. Okay. Was Lori Vallow present for that? No. Was Alex present for that? Yes. Okay. And what time did that end? I don't recall. Was it a long visit? I would say an hour-ish. Okay. Now on the uh, night of the 22nd, um, Alex Cox um, was babysitting JJ. Is that what I recall from your testimony? Yes. Okay. So I'd like to go through a, a brief timeline, if, if I may. Okay. Um, so you got back from a real estate event sometime late afternoon, something like that. Is that correct? Something like that. Then you and your boyfriend drove over to uh, um, um, Lori's apartment? After that, that meeting, yes. Yeah. Did Alex go with you in the same car? No, he had his own vehicle. Okay. Did Alex go over to Lori's apartment as well that day afterwards? I don't recall when he did. He was in and out often. He was, I'm sorry, what? He was in and out. He would come in and out of the house. So I don't recall exactly when he arrived or exactly when he did. I don't remember. He had a, he had an ability to just visit Lori. They, they were, they were very close and that he would just come in when he felt like it. Is that fair yeah, to say? I would, I would say that's fair. Okay. All right. And so at some point on the 22nd, he was coming in and out, correct? Yes. You talked a little bit about Alex carrying JJ back into Lori's apartment. Correct. Do you recall when that was approximately? Um, as I shared yesterday, it was sometime between the hours of 9 p.m. to midnight-ish. Did Alex stay in the apartment that night? And not to my knowledge. Well, how big of an apartment is this? There are three bedrooms upstairs and none downstairs. So uh, with you in one bedroom and your boyfriend in the other bedroom and... Um, Lori in the bedroom, where was JJ? She, he usually, he had like a little bed in the corner of her room. Okay. And so that's where she would have him sleep. Oh, okay. Was that a permanent structure in there, ma'am? It her was a bed, bed in a corner. Okay. And to your knowledge, did JJ, was JJ there at night between 9 and 12? To my there? knowledge, he was. And Alex put him to bed, is that correct? I just remember him coming in the house holding him, and then I turned back to the recording that I was doing that evening. Okay. And what was the nature of the recording then? We were recording um, a podcast with Lori present, and we were um, interviewing David, and he was sharing a lot of his personal spiritual experiences and conversion to our church. Okay, and that, that's, uh, that's the LDS religion? Correct. So Lori was actively involved as well in the LDS religion at that 
time during that meeting as well, correct? Correct. And, and she shared the same beliefs that you share in terms of, of the religion, is that correct? Correct. And Chad shared the same religious beliefs as part of the LDS church as well, correct? Correct. Okay. So all of you, David, yourself, Lori, and Chad, all share the same and are consistent with your LDS beliefs. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay, thank you. You got up in the morning on the 23rd? Sometime. Do you recall about what time, ma'am? I don't. Okay. But you do recall that uh, JJ wasn't there? Correct. Well, if you didn't know he slept there when you were doing your podcast, how did you know he was there? Wasn't there? As I said, I don't recall seeing him. I never recall seeing him. Oh, so he may have been there. I didn't see him. Okay, but he may have been there or he may not have been there. Would that be a fair statement? Sure. Well, I don't need sure. Is that a fair statement or is it an unfair statement? It could be fair. Okay, thank you. Did Lori rely on Alex for babysitting? Sometimes. I don't believe all the time. I don't I wouldn't know all her babysitting moments. And up until the time that Lori moved here around September 1st, Mr. Daybell wasn't a, a regular visitor with Lori Daybell prior to September 1st. Would that be fair? Calls for facts outside of evidence. Will you please repeat the question, Mr. Pryor? Would it be fair to say that Mr. Daybell was not a regular visitor with Lori Vallow until she moved here on September 1st? Would that be fair? Would it be fair that who is not a regular visitor? Would it be fair that Mr. Daybell was not a regular visitor with Ms. Vallow until after he moved here, until after she moved here on September 1st, ma'am? Mr. Wood, your, your objection I'll is... I'll the objection. Okay. Ms. Gibb, if you know the answer to that question, you can answer it. I, I know according to knowledge from what Lori shared that they visited often. Oh, they did. Was that prior to September 1st? Yes. Oh, so he would go to where, where was Lori living? She lived multiple places. Well, let's talk about that. Where was she living prior to September 1st? She was living in Chandler, Arizona. Okay, did she move somewhere else prior to Chandler? Yes. Where she live? She lived in Texas. I'm sorry. Yes, Texas. When do you have a recollection of when she lived in Texas? Um, I'm not sure exactly the months, but I want to say somewhere between April or May or of what year, ma'am? Or June of uh, 2019. I believe. Okay. Uh, yeah, this, yeah, 2019. And about how long did she live in Texas, ma'am? It seemed that it was around two months. It could have been a little bit more, a little bit less. And then she moved to Chandler, Arizona. Is that correct? Correct. Did she live any place after Chandler before she came to Rexburg? I don't think so. No. Well, you said multiple places. That's what I'm trying to get at. Was it just two places? No. So she lived with Alex Cox for a period of time. Oh, when did she live with Alex? So to th the beginning of 2019, after she left Charles, um, okay. and she also lived in Hawaii for a period of time. So right. Um, was she in, was hmm. she in Hawaii? And I'm not talking about the time that she was with Chad. Was she in Hawaii with Alex as well? I don't think he was there. I don't. I don't know for sure. It's possible he was in Hawaii as well. I, I don't recall it. He had a habit of, of kind of following her, didn't he? Well, I don't know following, but they were around each other a lot. And then she went to his house to, to, to live. So right. she went over there. So they were, they were pretty strongly bonded with each other, weren't they? Yes. I, I, I'm, and I didn't hear what the name was, and, and I apologize for my ignorance. Um, talk to me a little bit about, I, I, I think you said King Noah. Was it King Noah? Is that what you mentioned on the tape uh, when you were talking to Lori Vallow? 
Yes. Okay. Um, and the date of that conversation with Lori was when? December 8th again? Yes. And, and I, I missed, I, I was having some difficulty kind of gathering what, what the reference to King Noah was about. Tell me about that. Well, she brought, she brought the reference up to the fact that a uh, prophet named Alma, and she asked me about Alma. And so I explained to her, you know, the people that were surrounded with that occurrence of Alma. What's the occurrence of Alma? Mr. Pryor, you keep interrupting the witness, so it's extremely difficult for me to hear the last few words of her answer before you answer. So if okay. you'll please allow her to finish before you interrupt. Again, Your Honor, I apologize. No, no problem. So, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry, and I'll, I'll try to do better. I, I'm, I, I'm just intrigued by this. And, and, and obviously, please excuse my ignorance. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, Alma. Alma was a prophet, but before... <clears throat> he became that prophet. He was um, in a court as a high priest to um, a king called King Noah. But this King Noah was a very unrighteous king. Okay. And so Alma, being one of the judges or high priests um, that, were, that were listening to another prophet call them to repentance, named Abinadi, he started to feel that the, the actions of King Noah were evil, and he broke away from this group, and then he left. Okay, okay. And, and I, I got the, the sense that there was some sort of adultery over, uh, undertone there. Is that, am I misunderstanding that? Yeah, King Noah and his group of people tend to be breaking the commandments, and he became an unrighteous prophet. Okay, so adultery is obviously... That's Your Honor, I, I objection relevance. Mr. Pryor, do you want to respond to that? Well, Judge, there was some reference to Ms. Vallow's behavior and some reference to King Noah and, and, and uh, uh, Angel Maroney or something like that. And I think, quite honestly, I ought to be able to in inquire. If the tape was played. It was presented as evidence. And I think I at least ought to inquire what that reference and what she was referring to. So that's what I'm trying to get at is, is get an explanation of what that reference was because I am terribly confused about what they were talking about. Objection overruled. I'll allow the questioning. Okay. So, is is it was adultery part of this the 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 the, the dynamic of this uh, this issue with King Noah and and uh, the such? It was multiple things that King Noah. I, I said riotous living. Okay. What do you mean by things. right? Well, oh, we've got to stop. I'm sorry, Judge. Go ahead. Um. Well, I don't know everything that they were doing in the scriptural reference, other than they noted it. So, um, whatever that meant in their day. So, in multiple things, adultery obviously was one of those, correct? It was one of those. Okay. And in, in uh, um, the, the scripture that you're referring to, is there a biblical uh, source of that information and that story that you're telling me? Which scripture reference are you referring to? Yeah, the one about King Noah that you were discussing with Lori Vallow. What is the source? Of, what, what, uh, what, is there a, a book or a document that that story is told in? Oh, it's in the Book of Mormon. It's in the Book of Mormon. Okay. Correct. So your reference with Lori, obviously she understands that because she was actively and still participating in the LDS religion. Correct. And Mr. Daybell was actively participating in the LDS religion, correct? That I know of. Okay. And you are actively participating in the LDS religion. Correct. So all of you understood the references that you were yes. talking about. That's what I was trying to get at. And thank you, ma'am, for explaining that. I just, I, I didn't understand, okay? And please excuse okay. my ignorance. <clears throat> Oh, um, oh, I think I asked you about the podcast and what the subject was. It was a religious subject, was it not? Yes. Okay. Oh, I did. Um, and thank you. Um, Mr. Daybell was a author, is that correct? Is he an author? Yes. Correct. And he writes fiction. Is that correct? 
I haven't read all Objections his books. Objections beyond the scope, relevance. Mr. Pryor. Well, Judge, I, I think what she did is talk an awful lot about Mr. Daybell and her knowledge of Mr. Daybell. And I think quite honestly, if, if uh, I, I, I'm using this as a way of trying to find out exactly how familiar she is with Mr. Daybell. She made a number of statements. And I, quite honestly, I think I ought to be able to inquire about, uh, you know, how much does she know about Mr. Daybell? I think that's perfectly relevant. Mr. Wood. I failed to see how it's relevant at all, Your Honor. This is turning into a fishing expedition. Uh, preliminary here is in Preliminary hearing is not for the defense to engage in discovery. Uh, he's, he's limited in what he's supposed to ask to what was presented on direct. I agree with Mr. Wood. However, I think that there is some inquiry that can be made here. I, the question was ab about an author and what the, the substance of the books were, what genre they were. So I'll allow the questioning. You can continue to make your objection, Mr. Wood, if you'd like, if you feel it's going too far. Uh, you haven't read all of his books, but the nature of it is that he's a fiction writer. Is that fair? Fair. Okay. And you're, you're, I don't want to say fiance, you're not engaged to Mr. Warwick. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, Mr. Warwick is a writer as well? No. Oh, I was under the impression he was an author as well. He wrote some things. Is That's incorrect? Incorrect. Okay. Judge, I have nothing further. Thank you very much. And thank you, Ms. Gibb. I appreciate your patience with me. You're welcome. Mr. Wood, and you redirect. Your Honor, the state would ask for a five minute recess. We'll take five. Mr. Wood, do you wish to have redirect of the witness, Ms. Gibb? Yes, just briefly, Your Honor. You may proceed. Uh, Ms. Gibb, you testified that you were there when Chad and Lori met, correct? Correct. Um, now, Lori had told you, or is it true that Lori had told you she had read Chad Daybell's books? Yes. Before they met? Yes. And you recently testified that Lori and Chad met up several times, correct? Correct. And Lori told you about these, these, uh, these visits, correct? Yes. And they were infatuated with each other, weren't they? Yes. And Mr. Pryor asked you about your LDS belief. Yes. Questioned you quite rigorously about it. And you, you're a member of the LDS faith. And, yes. you say, and you testified that Chad, to your knowledge, is a member of the LDS faith. Correct? Correct. And Lori was a member of the LDS faith, correct? Correct. And that you, you had some level of bonding over the LDS faith, correct? Yes. But did Lori believe things that you didn't believe? Yes. Who taught her those things? She was taught um, through Chad. And how do you know that? Because she didn't seem to have knowledge of the things she shared with me until she met him. Okay. And did she ever tell you that Chad taught her things? Yes. Okay. The weekend of the 19th to the 23rd of September 2019. You testified earlier, didn't you, that Chad Daybell uh, was at Lori Ballow's residence several times? Yes. No further questions. Ms. Gibby makes be excused from the witness stand. Uh, Mr. Pryor, Mr. Wood, may this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Well, that wraps up episode four of season three, Afterglow, Unveiling the Idaho Cult. And stick around and go over to my YouTube channel. I plan to go to Chad's trial at least twice during the trial. I plan to go in the next couple weeks. And then I also plan to go again, hopefully at the very end of the trial. I will also be at CrimeCon this year in Nashville, Tennessee, the last weekend of May. I plan to be there. We're going to have a little meet and greet. If anybody would like to meet up, please let me know. And of course, I do appreciate you all. And I'll be back soon. I would like to continue getting these up every weekend, but I can't promise that just because of, you know, life, you know, life, <laughs> job, 
dogs, mom, kids, grandkids, you know, all that stuff. So again, thank you so much for listening to Afterglow Unveiling the Idaho Cult. Please share this with your friends and please give it a review if you're so inclined. Stay safe, stay well. I'm Kathy Brooks. Sources for today's show, Nate Eaton, East Idaho News, Justin Lum, Fox 10 Phoenix, Annie Cushing, Annie Liddick.